Thank you, Sean. Great song selections this morning. They're great every week, but just perfect for this morning. Uh, our hearts are, are prepared, Lord willing, uh, through what we've just sung and what we've just reflected on. If you're looking at the hard copy this morning, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, as we continue this uh, study through the first few chapters of Isaiah, this holiday season. And the title of my message this morning is Christ the Cornerstone, if you didn't figure that one out already. Christ the Cornerstone. Isaiah chapter 1. If I was to summarize it, as I said last week, I would quote to you Romans chapter 6, verse 23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so in Romans chapter 1, Isaiah establishes that because of Israel's sin, death is the result, destruction is the result, and there is coming an impending judgment. What's beautiful about the book of Isaiah is every time you read about the doom that sin brings, you read about the redemption, the future righteousness, and rescue of Jesus. Now, Isaiah isn't using the name of Jesus, but he is talking about this one who will come and make all things new again, who will come and repair all the damage that sin has done. And so now in chapter two, Isaiah wants to use vivid imagery for life in the light of God versus life in the darkness of this world. How do you compare and contrast life in the light of God and life in the darkness of this world. This was actually our table conversation this morning at about 6 a.m. as we had breakfast together, uh, my daughter Paige and my wife Annie and I, and talking about the Christmas season and some of the music we're gonna be doing coming up in the Christmas season and understanding the comparison of darkness and light because Christmas presents the juxtaposition of, of impending darkness and revealing light. You know, COVID-19 is a darkness on this earth. It is a result of the first sin of the first Adam. Before Adam and Eve, there was no pandemic. Adam's sin brought disease, decay, and death into this world, and as a result, thousands upon thousands of years later, we have a global pandemic attacking humanity, and we are dealing with the darkness that comes with but our peace in the midst of this incredible time is a result from the second Adam's sacrifice. And so the first Adam brings, brings death, disease, and decay, but the second Adam, the one prophesied in this book of Isaiah, brings wholeness, healing, and life. And so before you can appreciate the good news of the second Adam, you have to also understand the bad news of the first Adam. So we're going to talk about good news and bad news this morning. I don't know if anybody's ever come to you and said, hey, do you want the good news or the bad news? How many of you prefer the bad news first? Raise your hand. Bad news? Because you want to follow it up. You want to chase it down with good news. You want to end on a good note. How many of you prefer to have the good news first to prepare for the bad news? Yeah, me too, Maddie. I want the good news first because I know the bad news is going to be really bad. So I want to go into the bad news with a trajectory of the good news, right? Well, Isaiah starts here with good news, and then ends with bad news. Kind of ends on a downer, but never without the understanding and remembrance of God's promised one. Now the context here, Isaiah has set the stage that Israel has offered wordship instead of worthship. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go and watch last week's sermon, what real worship is, what God really desired, more than just paying lip service and bringing sacrifices. He wanted a life of yielding surrender and worship from this nation. He's now going to talk about the need for humility and the need to acknowledge God as our only source of hope, peace, and safety. And so remember, throughout Isaiah, and, and in all scripture really, it's not just the book of Isaiah, whenever we see a declaration of righteous judgment, we also see the promise of righteous mercy through the Savior. You can't have one without the other. You also can't have the righteous mercy of the Savior declared without understanding the righteous judgment that you deserve. Now in verse 12, Isaiah prophesies the day of the Lord in which Israel 
will be chastised, will be chastened through exile. God was going to allow these people to be defeated by the Assyrians and Persians. He was going to allow them to lose the protective rights of the covenant and be taken into exile, away from their nation, away from their homeland, away from their homes. Their families would be scattered. And during this time, the people would seek safety and security in places like fortresses and caves. They would be hiding from these these oppressive empires coming in to take them captive. They would have to take their safety and security into their own hands. You know, we're living in a world where everybody's trying to take their safety, their security into their own hands. You did it this morning. You found your mask. You found your hand sanitizer. Begrudgingly, of course. You reminded your kids, when we come home, wash your hands, all right? Don't lick the seats. Don't eat gum off the floor. You know, we go through it, right? We're taking all the security into our own hands right now. That's exactly what was happening to the Israelites as God removes his hand of protection and all that sin brings forth is going to knock on their door. And so ultimately, the message of Isaiah chapter 2 is that Israel's purpose for Zion was to... Was to to create eternal safety and security, but that would never be accomplished in their own efforts. They would not be able to create their own safety and security. There was not enough strength, there was not enough power, there was not enough wisdom or knowledge. Only the coming Messiah would bring true peace. And this is why the last verse, verse 22 in this chapter says this, stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath for of what account is he? Stop placing all your hope in mankind. Stop believing that there's power within mankind to protect itself, to make itself great, to give itself peace, to bring itself healing and wholeness. We cannot heal ourselves. We cannot even protect ourselves from global pandemics. So in chapter one, Isaiah starts with bad news and he ends with good news. Here in chapter two, Isaiah starts with good news and he's gonna end with bad news. Let's look at the good news. All right, here's the good news. Verse one through five says that the good news is this, that humanity has been offered deliverance. Humanity has been offered deliverance from the destructive decay of our sinfulness. Now, kids, if you're taking notes, on your kid's sheet there, there's a clue, all right? I circled it there for you. What's the good news? What's the good news? That God has offered us deliverance. That God has offered us deliverance. Let me look at some of these verses here in the beginning of Isaiah chapter two. Let's look at verse two. Here's what it says. It shall come to pass in the last days Or in the latter days, it says, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Notice that all of the nations of the world in the latter days are going to flock or flow to the mountain, up the mountain. They are walking up away from the depths of the earth. Now, logic tells us that when you are looking at a hill, it's easier to go down the hill. When you pour water, it runs down the hill. When you roll a snowball, it snowballs down the hill or a boulder down a hill. When you fall and trip like Jack and Jill, you roll where? Down the hill, right? And yet Isaiah says, on the mountain of God, in the latter days when Jesus does his work, everybody's gonna go up that hill. They're gonna be climbing to get to what Jesus is offering. They're they're gonna be searching out peace and they're gonna be willing to work at getting close to God, pursuing God, pursuing the peace that he offers through his Messiah. Remember, Isaiah wants to help the people understand that this is the end of the story. All right, that's the end. What they're about to experience is not the end. When they go into exile, Even, and by the way, even the good people that are still following the Lord, that are still going wholeheartedly after God are going to suffer the effects of a sinful nation. People like Daniel are going to be taken into exile just like everybody else. And they're going to suffer the effects of sin. You know, a lot of really good people have passed away because of this pandemic. 
And their direct sin didn't cause this pandemic, and yet a sinful world has brought this to happen. We have all experienced the effects of what is taking place. That one sin of Adam has affected everyone. And what we have to understand is our sin does affect this world. It doesn't just affect us. Even those minute sins, you think, well, nobody else is affected by this. No, it affects this world. All of creation groans because of the sin of mankind. And yet God wants them to understand that's not the end of the story. One sacrifice could heal all of mankind. One righteous lamb given in sacrifice. Jesus referenced this understanding of going up the mountain in Matthew chapter five, verses 13 through 16. He talks about salt and he talks about light and he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put light, uh, a light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others so they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. Jesus said, I, bring, I am bringing the light and that light doesn't just affect you. When you let that light change your life, it affects the whole world. It gives hope to the whole world. You can't hide a city lit up on the hillside. The gospel is light for a weary, weary world. Look at verse three. He says, the prophet says, and many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He's talking about Jesus being lifted up. He's talking about Jesus being sacrificed, crucified on the cross of Calvary as the sacrificial lamb, he's talking about Jesus being the true king, the only one worthy of sitting on a throne in the temple. And so the idea of the gospel going out to all nations comes from Isaiah's prophecy. In fact, we know this to be true because Jesus quoted Isaiah in Luke chapter 24, verses 47. After his resurrection, he meets these two forlorn disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're sad, their, their savior has been crucified. They're struggling to make sense of it. Jesus shows up and walks with them. They don't know it's him. And here's what he said, all right? It says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written. All right, he quotes the prophet Isaiah. This verse, verses two and three of Isaiah two. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And then he says this, you are witnesses of these things. In other words, I am fulfilling Isaiah. I am leading you to the mountain of God. I am proclaiming the fulfillment of the law. I am proclaiming peace to the nations. I am bringing light to the world. I am the fulfillment of the prophets. Look at verse four. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, all right? They're gonna take the steel of the sword that's meant for war, and they're gonna beat it into something different for harvesting. There's peace, they can harvest. And their spears into pruning hooks, all right? So war equipment becomes farming equipment. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This concept of the peace of God through Jesus is repeated in chapter nine, verses five through seven, by the way. And it gives us the clue to know how God would use Israel to bring peace to all the nations. How is Israel gonna bring peace to all the nations? Not through Israel, through Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Jesus is the peace of Israel that brings peace to the nations of the world. And that is why it is written in Isaiah chapter nine that Jesus would be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Paul references this idea in Ephesians chapter five. Look at this verse. It says in Ephesians chapter five, verses 13 and 14, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. 
For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul quotes there Isaiah. He quotes chapter 51, verse 17, chapter 52, verse 1, chapter 60, verse 1. He's talking about the light of the coming Messiah in all of those passages, and that's what, exactly what Paul grabs out of the book of Isaiah, the light that Jesus has brought, the peace that Jesus has brought, the hope that Jesus has brought. Well, what about the bad news? If the good news is that God has a plan through the Messiah to make better all that is broken, to redeem all humanity, what's the bad news? Well, let's look at it. Verses 6 through 22 give us the bad news that humanity is doomed in its selfishness and pride. All right, so kids, in your kid's sheet, what's the bad news? The bad news is that humanity is doomed. I like that word. Doomed. You can say it that way too. That's not a good thing. You know why everyone dies? Because everyone's a sinner. Do you know that it's appointed unto man once to die? God knows the numbers of your days before you're even born, and he has a birth date, and he has a death date. And that death date wasn't supposed to be, and that death date exists because of Adam's sin, because of Eve's sin, and because of your sin. That's the bad news. Of course, we know the good news is that God gives us life after death. But let's talk about the bad news a little bit and why it happens. Why do we die? Well, verse 8, he starts to explain to them what is going on, what has brought about the chastisement of the nation of Israel. Why are they going to die? Why are they going to be exiled? Why is there going to be destruction and decay? Well, first of all, their land is filled with idols. Their land is filled with idols. It says in verse 8, their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. In life groups this week and last week, we've talked about idols. And he gave us a great way to evaluate where does our idolatry lie in our own lives. Some great questions, some great emotions to look at. I hope you, you got into that study. It was eye-opening for myself. A couple things to draw out here. First of all, a good indicator, and we talked about this in life groups, a good indicator of your idols is what you spend the most time fearing or dreaming about. What do you fear the most? What's that thing? God, if you did that, I would struggle. That's your idol. God, if you took that away, I would struggle to trust you. God, if you made that happen, I would be angry with you. Wherever that is, that's your idol. Or what do you spend your time dreaming about? What's your focus? What gets you the most excited? That's probably your idol as well. These are probably good things. Or the bad things are probably really bad things. And, and we can take these really good things that God has given us like family and, and, and monetary blessing and health and we can turn them into God things and they become idols. We've been studying a book in our pastoral team meetings called LEAD. We as pastors can take ministry things that are good things that honor God and bless people and we can make them idols because we can make them about us. We can, do it. We can make idolatry out of anything. Another good indicator of what you idolize or worship is where you first turn in times of crisis or blessing. You think about when crisis hits, and it's a good indicator of where your idolatry is. What's the first thing you do? What's the first call you make? What's your first reaction? Or, conversely, when it's really good news. I'm a stress eater, and I'm a joy eater. If I get really bad news, I want a donut. If I get really good news, I want to celebrate with cake. Those are my first responses. I can tell you where my idolatry lies a lot of times. This is how I feel, and what makes me feel hyped and excited and happy. That's me. Think about your, yourself. In our small group study, we talked about how Luther uh, taught that all 10 commandments are broken in commandment number one. 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And if you look at the rest of the nine commandments, you, if you fulfill the first commandment, having no other God before you other than Yahweh, you will fulfill the rest of the commandments. But we lie and we murder and we curse God and we commit adultery because we are worshiping something other than God. Verse 9 gives us this humility perspective. It, it tells us that humility is the prescription for sin. Humility is the prescription for sin. It says in verse 9, so man is humbled and each one is brought low. Do not forgive them. And what he's saying is when they are proud, there is no forgiveness. Israel is proud. They are not humble. They are proud of what they've accomplished. They are proud of their own strength. They're proud of their own righteousness and it is leading them into idolatry. Remember that all sin comes from pride and selfishness. Satan brought sin into this world. Satan's first sin was pride and selfishness. He wanted God's throne and he wanted God's power. The humbling of the proud is the recurring theme of the rest of this chapter, by the way. And this is a result of a lack of confession and repentance without which we cannot be forgiven. Remember, 1 John 1.12, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. When we confess, we are practicing humility. I can't confess if I'm proud. I can't confess that I'm a sinner in need of grace, in need of forgiveness, if I think everything I do is awesome. At some point, I have to humble myself and admit I'm a sinner. Verse 10 Verse 10 tells us to enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. Why? Because we cannot save ourselves from the wrath of God. And so if you're going to hold on to your pride and your selfishness, if you're not going to humble yourself before God, you better do something to hide from God's wrath because God's wrath is impending. His doom is coming. We don't like to talk about the wrath of God these days. Gone are the days of fire and brimstone, and yet the Bible is filled with so much of that speech. The danger of having a stiff neck against God, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. And that is a grace. It is a grace to tell people the danger of their pride and selfishness. That is not angry. That's not mean. That's not accusatory. That is grace. I care about you enough to tell you that your pride and selfishness will destroy you, and I hope you care enough about me to tell me the same thing. That's a grace, that's a kindness. You think about the devastation of sin, what is it? War, dangerous weather, pandemics, and what do these things all force us to do? All three of these things, war, dangerous weather, pandemics, force us to hide and seek shelter. And that is what sin causes us to do. You think about the first response of Adam and Eve after they sinned, what did they do? They hid, they sought shelter. The Bible says they realized their nakedness was exposed. They were ashamed. They felt guilt. And so they hid in the forest as if they could actually hide from God. They sought shelter. That's what sin causes us to do. It causes us to draw inward. It causes us to hide. I'm always suspect when somebody disappears from church. My first question is, what are they struggling with? Because if you don't understand grace, you hide. And one of the first places we hide from is other believers. We don't want to deal with the tough stuff. Our pride and selfishness, we want to keep that intact. By the way, this is the story all the way to the end of days. Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 16, talk about a people hiding from the judgment of God, crying out for the rocks and the hills to bury them to hide them, and they're seeking safety and security in caves. But Jesus, think about this. Jesus offers the contrast of strength on the rock from hiding in the rocks. What does sin cause us to do? Sin forces us to hide in the rocks, in the clefts, in the caves. And what does Jesus want us to do? Stand firm with courage on the rock cornerstone. And when the gospel is our foundation, we have the strength and courage to do so. 
Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16 gives an even more beautiful picture of Jesus as the stone of Zion. It says this in verse 14, therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol we have made an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. The religious leaders were saying, oh, we've protected ourselves. We're hiding in the temple. We're hiding behind religion. We're hiding behind our own righteousness. God's not going to chasten us. He can't see what's going on inside of us. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid a, as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. Isaiah says to these religious leaders, your righteousness will not save you. You can hide in the caves and the clefts of your own righteousness. You will be destroyed. You, the only shelter you can find, the only shelter that's going to save you is the shelter of the chief cornerstone. On that foundation will you survive. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses was given a lesson in hiding in the cleft or the cave. He says, I want to see your glory, God. And God says, you can't see my glory, Moses. You can't handle it. But I'll tell you what, you hide in the rocks. You hide in the clefts. You hide in the cave. And when I pass by, I'll let you peek around and see behind me where I'm going. And so he hides in the cleft, in the cave. And he experiences just a shadow of God's glory. And and we understand the imagery that we can only handle God's glory through the shelter of the rock, Jesus. Jesus is the shelter that allows us to, to be in the presence of an almighty God who is perfect in righteousness. Only Jesus brings us shelter. So here's our application this morning. If your cornerstone of hope right now in all that we're experiencing, in all that we're about to experience, and we know we're not out of the woods yet, if your cornerstone of hope isn't Jesus Christ, the structure of your life will crumble and you will seek shelter in the caves of this world. We are facing a mental illness disaster right now. We are seeing suicide like the likes we've never seen before. You know why? Because people are seeking shelter and hope in the caves of their life, and they are hopeless. They are shelterless. And without the gospel, they will not survive what the earth is going to bring. The only hope we have is the gospel, the security found in the hope and peace of Jesus Christ. We used to sing about this in Sunday school. Why do we get it right in Sunday school and not in life? The wise man builds his house upon a rock. Good job. If kids can understand this, what is this about? This is about Jesus. Building our life on Jesus. Finding our hope, our shelter, our security in Jesus. Not the sands of this earth that are fleeting. Kids, if you're looking at your kid's sheet, here's your clue. Key word we're talking about that begins with the letter C. You know what it is? Can you figure it out? Jesus is our chief what? Cornerstone. Cornerstone. Let me read the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 7. He says this in verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now this is Jesus who knows he's been prophesied as the chief cornerstone, who knows he's the only hope for humanity, and now he's looking at them and he's saying, I'm giving you the word, I'm giving you the word of light and life. Build your life on this word and you will build your life on a rock. The rock. He says this in verse 25, and the rain fell. Weather, right? We seek shelter in weather. And the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. 
He goes on to say this, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus was having this conversation with Peter in Matthew chapter 16. He said, hey, Peter, Petra, your name means rock. But on this rock, the chief cornerstone, I'm going to build my church. And then he gives this prophecy of, of hope and peace. And he says, the gates of hell itself will not prevail against it. Where do you turn? As more discouraging news comes, as hard times come, as plans get canceled, as people get sick, as finances run out, where do you turn? Where you turn first is a good indicator of where your hope lies. I read this quote from Timothy Keller this morning. He's the teacher we're using for our life groups. He, he wrote this on Facebook this morning. And here's a man, by the way, who's battling pancreatic cancer. All right? So... When people are battling cancer, they have something to say. We should listen, right? Because they're in the thick of it. Here's what he said this morning. The world's peace is intermittent based on transitory circumstances. But Christian peace is constant based on the never-changing love of God. That's our peace. The never-changing love of God. That is the cornerstone. That is the bedrock that we built our lives on. That is where we get our strength and our courage and our conviction. We don't need to hide. We don't need to seek shelter. We don't need to solve our own problems. The Lord has the answers. We need to get up on that rock. We need to lift our hands in the air. We need to praise God. That our foundation is solid. That at the end of all things on this earth, we will have the gospel. We will have the never-changing love of God. Let's stand. Let's reflect on those thoughts for a minute as Sean comes. Would you just take a moment of inventory for yourself? Would you just ask yourself a quick question, self? Where am I turning? What's my first call? What's my first reaction? What's my first thought when trials come? When plans are changed, when the money runs out, when someone is unhealthy, what is my first thing? God, is that thing you? If it isn't, would it help it to be you? Because if it's not, it's a cave, it is a cleft, and I don't need to hide. God, would you make that thing be you? Would you lead me away from my idolatry? Would you help me to find hope and peace? God, that is our prayer, that we would find hope and peace in the gospel. Nothing else is going to sustain us in this time. You are the chief cornerstone, the promised one who brings Zion to the nations of the world. We are coming up to you. We are in the valley. We need your light. We need your hope. We need your strength. And so we humbly come to you and confess our frailty, confess our sin, confess our doubts, confess our lack of faith. We ask you to strengthen us through the gospel. We pray this in your name. Amen.